Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary from my new office. Now in this lecture we're going to be looking at a line of biomechanics. This was a lecture given by the expert Tommaso Castroflorio as part of the WFO online lectures. He asked some great questions looking at patient compliance but also looking at the reality of evidence-based practice and what our understanding is from aligners as a consequence. Just to recap, the podcast is the opinion piece of myself and the orthodontics and summary team. It may not be 100% representative of the original lecture, but we try our best to ensure that it is. So back to the episode. He asked the first frank question. What is the compliance of patients with aligners? Now, I think this is a really insightful question to ask, and we now have a study to look at this. It's a study by Thermosorthy in 2021. And what this paper looked at was the overall compliance of patients. It was around a third. 36% of patients were fully compliant. Interestingly, 25%, a quarter, were poorly compliant. Now, first-time orthodontic patients seemed to be better patients than those who had previous experiences. He also spoke about previous studies looking at removable appliances and things that we can recommend from Fleming's 2019 paper. Effective communication, having visual aids for patients. Using a tracking sensor can be useful, but also having some form of a reminder tool for patients, including remote reminders and monitoring. The mainstay of Thomas O's lecture was to look at aligner biomechanics. He started off with that raw fact. Aligner predictability has been shown to be 50%. That was Holyu's study from 2019, and that was a landmark study. He looked further into the study and actually it showed 74% of randomly chosen cases, patients actually passed the ABO. The outcomes were good. So he made that statement. The reason why him and lots of colleagues will still use aligners, despite this mean accuracy being 50%, is because their outcomes are still generally good. And what factors influence this? So we then looked at attachments, and attachments are, as we understand it, a key component of aligner use. But he looked at his experience, and then he looked at the literature. His opinion was attachments maximise anchorage and aligner interaction. However, the evidence does not support that. And actually, our understanding from the research is moments can be created, but are occurring on aligners without interacting with the attachment. What's more, when the moment takes place on an attachment, there are multiple surfaces of interface which can degrade the intended force. And he gave his example of when this occurs. He spoke about it with extraction cases. Now this relates to Zoo's paper from 2023, which essentially showed posterior and, anchor, posterior and anterior anchorage loss with the extraction case and how the aligner essentially squeezes the teeth together. So in that squeezing process, we get measles tipping off the teeth adjacent to the extraction site, intrusion of the mandibular molars as well. How do we correct for that with aligners? Well, it simply involves vertical correction. We extrude the middle of the dental arch. We also have the use of class two elastics, which stop the intrusion effect taking place on the mandibular molars. He also spoke about building an anchorage to the aligner staging. That's something not spoken very much of, but he spoke about preparing 1.7 degrees of uprighting force per aligner, and therefore we're able to maximize the anchorage for the patient. His concluding statements were quite profound. He spoke about how we are focused only on attachments, and aligners are elastic, and they're going to deform, and we, that can provoke an undesired movement that we need to control. He then went on to describe different types of aligner movements. Rotations are difficult on round teeth due to the linear force application, specifically with canines. In a paper that Thomas O has published, he spoke about the use of adding attachments, yes, but also looking at reducing the amount of activation per aligner by one degree. And if we stick to using 1.2 degrees, actually that can be too much. He also spoke about overcorrection. I love this part of Thomas O's lecture. It's something which is described, but we don't have numbers with it. 
And now Thomas O has helped us out. In his 2023 paper, he spoke about maxillary canine rotation correction. And for every one degree of planned movement, we need 0.4 millimeters, almost half a degree of overcorrection to achieve the result. In the mandibular molar, it's a little bit less, 0.3 degrees of every one degree of planned movement for overcorrection. 14 days helps us out for difficult movements. If we have 14 day changes, we can increase our accuracy by 12%, specifically looking at lower canines, premolar torque, and lower molar rotation. These are the key movements to watch out for and instigate our overcorrection. Thomaso then went on to look at class two correction through distalization. Now he started off with what the research has suggested by Patterson's 2021 paper, which showed exceptionally poor outcomes using the ABO for aligner class two cases. Now Thomaso's response to this was actually aligners are just an appliance and it's the delivery which is through planning that gets us our outcomes. He spoke about distalization with aligners and we do get posterior vertical anchorage loss as well as anterior proclination or anchorage loss as well. And he's mentioned how he can create a four system. We can use class two elastics to extrude the posterior teeth hence correcting the vertical anchorage loss, and also prevent the anterior anchorage loss through the use of class two elastics. And he mentioned the effectiveness of use of aligners with class two elastics. And that was Rivera's paper from 2016. Yes, attachments do help from the canine through to the posterior tooth. And we can then achieve, predictably, a two to three millimeter distalization with aligners. He then looked at incisor intrusion and how it's difficult to achieve pure intrusion with the use of aligners. Whether we're using a one-stage approach to lower incisor intrusion or a two-stage approach, i.e. canines intruded first, followed by the two to two. Actually, Liu's paper from 2018 indicates even if we use a two-stage approach, it's only about 0.2 millimeters of true intrusion taking place. And actually, we tried doing all three of, or from lower six, lower three to three, actually we get proclination of the lower incisors. So we've got the real challenge in the upper arch to intrude teeth, especially with a greater column angle or crown to root angulation. And he's mentioned how we need to consider utilizing palatal attachments to control this intrusion effect. His concluding thoughts were that aligners are plastic material. And we need to consider how we are activating to also allow for its deformation and our planned outcomes for our patients. The use of overcorrection when appropriate for cases, we can consider from the outset. And I think the most insightful thing for me is his idea of staging and how reducing the activation can help to flatten the amount of actual force decay occurring per aligner. We operate through a narrow range of forces when we use our aligners and get closer to a more predictable system. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. I'd like to thank our sponsors, TOC and the Aligner Intensive Fellowship for their support. And to thank the cameraman, Greg Anderson, for helping set up my new studio and office for this episode. And finally, a charity appeal for myself. I'm working with UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, to help raise money for children for their basic needs in the conflicted region of Gaza at this time of year. Please do donate generously. As always, please do subscribe. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.